Hi, I'm Phil Hill, and welcome to eLiterate TV's series on personalized learning. In this series, we're going to explore that term, which is heavily marketed but poorly understood, and try to look at how it's actually implemented at a variety of colleges and universities. What problems are they trying to solve? How is it actually implemented in practice? And how well is it going? Today, we're going to be looking at Essex County College, an open admissions community college in the heart of Newark, New Jersey. Eighty-five percent of our students start in the lowest level developmental math course. Eighty-five? Eighty-five percent start in the lowest level math course, which has a pass rate traditionally of 50 percent. So we end up with 50 students. In the second developmental math course, we have a pass rate of 40 percent. So of those 50 who made it past level one, only 20 make it out of level two. College level math, college algebra, has a pass rate of 50 percent. So of the 20 students who make it into college level math, 10 make it out. Well, we have a wide demographics of students. For example, we have students that have been returning after 20, 30 years. You know, they decided to change their career or maybe they never were able to get a degree and now they want a better job, so they come back. We also have students that come straight from high school. A few students that are still in high school and are through a special program, they can take some college classes. Um, but what they have in common is somewhere along their, their journey, they have skills that they have not mastered and they need it. Mm -hmm. And so they're with us. So one of the big motivations for picking ad an adaptive learning solution was that the students coming in, especially at the lower level developmental math course, have a range of skills from essentially fourth grade math, which is whole number operations, uh, up to, say, 10th or 11th grade math, which would be uh, graphing linear equations, doing rate problems, proportions, decimals, fractions, percents, and so on. And because we have such a wide range, uh, teachers inevitably teach to the middle. And the students at the bottom are lost in a couple of weeks. The students at the top are bored for the first eight weeks. And some of them stop coming and fail the course that they were so well prepared for just because after eight weeks of, of just being tired of listening to stuff they already know, they got in the habit of not attending class. And like the, the tortoise and the hare, right, the hare fell asleep and never finished the race. So, so we, we were looking for a solution that could serve students with this very wide range of initial mathematical skills. I'm trying to further my education in becoming a teacher. And not that I consider myself good at math, but I like it and I think it's a good subject. So, <laughs> and so I was enrolled in the Alex program as well and I thought it was a really good program for myself considering that I haven't been to school in 10 years. Um, I'm a Nigerian. I went through my high school back there home, so coming, I graduated about two years ago. So since then I've been out of school, I've been working and doing stuff. So coming over to the United States, I couldn't go into the four-year college, so I have to kind of come here to brush up. So going through this class has really helped me because back in high school, my major problem has been maths. And going through a class structured like this where you can learn and pick up from where you left, not really going necessarily, not really going after everything they have to teach you from like the first step to the place you just start from where you are. So going through this class it has helped me to brush up of things that I don't know, not necessarily the whole class. I think it's good. It's, okay. it's the best. So the the class is organized into two parts. One part is active student learning on the computer with adaptive math software. And that occupies three 80-minute sessions a week. And some of the students call it self-paced learning, which is really a misnomer. I mean, self-paced learning is when the students decide how much time to put in and what days to show up, and that's not what we have. These students are scheduled. This is a regular class schedule. We take attendance. We expect them to be there. And in that sense, it's not self-paced at all. But it is individualized. 
so that a student should never get lost and should never get bored. They should always be receiving content, math content, that is appropriate to the level of what they're ready to learn. A typical day is like you basically come in, you go in, you log on, you do your Alex, you do it at your own pace. Every individual works at their own pace, that's why I like it. Mm -hmm. Because you know, some people are ahead and if you're in a typical, a regular class, then you have to go with the pace of everybody else. Even if you don't understand, you have to be, you have to try to catch up. Here you work at your own pace. It's, it's been a very good experience for, you know, the, basically the same reasons. We just sit and you work and you, if you can solve, you know, 10 problems in one hour, it's better for you, in, you know, if you keep working at your own pace. And there's also the professor that helps you, or you can even bother one of your classmates and say, hey, can you <laughs> help me out over here with this problem or something like that. I mean, it's, I feel as if it's a very interactive and open classroom as, as per other classes. I don't think that a regular math class would be able, I mean, you would be able to sit and ask a per, another classmate for help or anything like that, you would have to just wait for your professor. So as I said, we have three 80-minute sessions that are active learning in the lab. In addition, we have two 50-minute sessions a week devoted to self-regulated learning. And, and in these classes, we talk about math a little bit, but most of it is talking about how do people learn? How do you learn? What are the strategies that make you successful? How can you tell if it's a successful strategy or not? And I think even more than that, these 50-minute sessions serve as community building. The students start feeling like they are in this together, and they look forward to seeing each other, and they, I think they would feel like they would maybe not let the group down, but it would be a little bit awkward if they stopped coming and they ran into a friend in the, in the hallway and they said, hey, you know, what happened? Nope. You know, when you feel like you're connected to your classmates, I believe it adds an extra measure of motivation. And, and I think motivation, that's my number one goal for this, for this self-regulated learning part of the class. Despite the popular assumption that many ed tech approaches such as personalized or adaptive learning use technology to replace faculty, what we see at Essex is that the faculty have a central role in this program, albeit a different role. The centerpiece of the program is a pedagogical approach called self-regulated learning, or SRL. The goal is to teach students how to be better, more strategic learners. To design the program, the college got help from John Hudesman from the Center for Advanced Study and Education at the CUNY Graduate Center. The first part is a, is a planning phase where students are expected to review their past work, mm -hmm. see, you know, kind of what they've done in the past, do a task analysis of you know, how to break things down into bite-sized pieces, then pick out the strategies that they're going to use in this particular situation, and then we ask them to set a goal. You know, if you use this, how good are you going to be at the end of all of this? And then we also ask them to make some uh, judgments, so, uh, SRL-type judgments. The second phase is the actual practice phase where students implement the strategies and then as they're implementing the strategies on the fly we ask them you know do you want to make any adjustments if so what adjustments do you want to make at the third phase which is the evaluation phase students then look at what was their goal for example my goal might be to earn a grade of at least 85 in Douglas's math class in fact, I might have only earned a grade of 75. And so now I have to look at what strategies did I use to get this 75? Which strategies worked a, a lot? Which strategies could I tweak to work better? And which strategies do I discard? And I, I have to then go through that literally in a very concrete way and come up with, in effect, a new learning plan. So the program is cyclical. It goes planning, practice, evaluation, back to planning. Two days a week before Alex, we have the self-learning class, self-regulated learning, which is here. And 
we are explained how it works and why we should, you know, set goals for ourselves and keep working on Alex and everything like that. And then we are we go to the lab. You know, you can keep um, furthering yourself and just keep moving on. And for our cases, since that's our goal to take out our remedial classes out of the way, this is something very helpful. What's important here is that students and faculty, for that matter, understand that it's not an all or nothing situation. That each time the student goes through an SRL cycle, they learn a little bit more about themselves as learners. And as they do this, they get better. But it's not one like, oh, I didn't get an 85, SRL sucks, I suck, I'm going home. It's a process. And it's that process that makes students believe that they control the learning, you know, their own learning. It's not something like, oh, you know, I'm no good at math. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, it's, I think it's the greatest so far in my educational life because back in Africa where I schooled, you don't really have anyone to tell you, okay, you have to learn how to set goals. You have to set goals that are achievable. You have to, um, like structure your life, blah, 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 stuff like that, yeah. Uh -huh. you, no, you don't really have that. And it really makes the difference because it helps you to set a solid foundation on how to learn, not just in this course. Mm -hmm. I think when you have someone telling you what to do, what you need to do to get to where you want to be, it helps. So after going through all this in the prep class, you're actually like facing it real life in the lab. So you know now when you have a problem, you, can, you, you don't have to keep quiet and just pretend as if you're good with it. You can actually now speak up and get yourself to really understand because you know if you don't understand, it's on you, you understand, it's on you. I think the prep class helps. The adaptive learning software that the college uses, McGraw-Hill's Alex, provides support and scaffolding to the students as they practice self-regulated learning. It's important for students to spend the time Right? I mean, learning takes time and it's hard work. Asking students to keep time diaries is a very difficult ask. But when they're working in an online platform, the platform keeps track of their time. So uh, on the first class day of the week, that's goal setting day. How many hours are you going to spend working on your math? How many topics are you planning to master? How many classes are you not going to be absent from? I mean, these are pretty simple goals. And then, and then we give them a, a, a couple goals that they can just write whatever they feel like. And I've had students write, you know, I want to come to class with more energy and, and other such goals. And then because we've got uh, technology as our content delivery system at the end of the week, I can tell them in a very efficient fashion that doesn't take up a lot of my time, you met your time goal, you met your topic goal, or you approached it, or, or you didn't. And as John was saying, it's not about passing or failing. It's about you set a goal. If you made it, you must have implemented some successful strategies. Let's be very conscious of what those are and keep them going. And if you approached it, you must have had some successful strategies. What was working for you? How can you expand on that? And if you didn't meet it, you know, we have to ask, you know, maybe you need to try some new strategies. It goes to the issue of, you know, if you have a successful experience and you feel like you're getting constructive feedback and then being told to do something with it, you have a good shot at succeeding. If, on the other hand, you feel like a failure, you're going to close down, walk away, and it's the end of the ballgame. Mostly what the conventional, normal math class you know, do is trying to advise you on how to study, how to set goals, and just how to make yourself better in the course. Okay. So what we do in the classroom is getting out, making ourselves understand the steps forward. Then when we go into the lab, we actually try to implement those steps we, we spoke about and try to learn what you do. The thing is, there is no rush in things. So you're working at your own pace and what you don't understand, you're now comfortable to call the attention of the professor to ask him questions and he will tell you this is the way forward or you can do it this way. So I think 
from the class to the lab, everything, it merges together to form a very, very nice course, so it's fun. But making the program work wasn't easy or cheap. In addition to the faculty professional development and software license cost, the college needed new wired classrooms that could accommodate the unusual structure of the course. College President Gail Gibson made a $1.2 million commitment to invest in the program. I think if the, if the leadership is not actively engaged in these changes, mm -hmm. that they will die, they will be off into another silo in the closet. So um, in order for them to work and in order for students to be successful so that they don't deplete their financial aid, so that they know which courses they need to take, and, and just a timely march towards graduation, I think the president needs to be visible, vocal, and extremely bold. What is the role of the president's office, certainly in this example, to putting this program in place? How active do you have to be in um, develop, developing or supporting the program? Extremely active, hands-on. Um, to show the support, number one, to the faculty, that it's not going a replacement for the faculty, mm -hmm. that it's a complement to ensure that we put monies in professional development so that the faculty can be trained on the use of the actual software and how to work with students and the change within the classroom uh, structure uh, when they have to use it within the labs. So it's definitely a hands-on involvement and the resources that are necessary necessary are professional development, uh, materials, just um, providing them with data, the faculty with data on how it's working. So it does start from the top and in order for the faculty to feel comfortable and for them to be engaged and supportive, um, it does start from the top. Trying to solve their remedial math problem, the college leadership realized they needed to do much more than buy an adaptive learning software package. They required a new pedagogical approach, faculty development, new student support structures, and new classroom infrastructure. The program is in its early days, so we don't have hard data to gauge the results. In the next episode, we're going to talk to faculty and students and see how they think the program is working.